lot of panels before Clara and, and Steve wanted to do something a little bit different. So they wanted to kind of have like a presidential debate style um, um, conversation where everyone here gets like 90 seconds to answer <clears throat> a question, then we kind of go down the line super fast. So as you saw in the previous presentation, um, robo-advisors is still a relatively small uh, percentage of, of, of affecting total asset management, but you know these companies are clearly betting that that could change pretty rapidly. So we're going to hear from all of them about whether that's true or not. Are the robots taking our jobs? Um, so I will start with the first just very simple question, which is like, give us, give us the 90 second elevator pitch. and. Um, Tell us why, why you're different. You ready? OK. Go ahead. <laughs> so I think we probably should start with like what is robo. Yeah. And I think this is probably one of those things where what you think we do and what we actually do are totally different. Yeah. Um, but basically, I think we have a pretty strong belief, as does Bo, that you know, I think the application of digital and technology to wealth management is probably pretty broad. You know, it's not just this narrow slice of what Betterment and Wealthfront represent, which is automated investment advice for millennials. Um, so I think you know, we, we probably both feel like partnering with large financial institutions as well as serving a pretty yeah. broad audience of investors is a big part of you know, where the world is headed. And I know a lot of the folks in the room probably represent traditional wealth management or at least financial mm -hmm. services companies. And I think you probably all have a pretty amazing opportunity to build more scalable businesses, serve yeah. a lot more clients, and hopefully get to better outcomes. But, but what's your angle? Like, you got 38 seconds. <laughs> what's your <laughs> Well, we like partnering with financial institutions okay. instead of trying to, you know. Compete with them directly. Yeah. yeah. The, you know, you've got other robo-advisors who kind of pound their chest saying, oh, you know, we're going to put, put the old guys out of business. Yeah. And, you know, we kind of think that <clears throat> when firms have been around for 100 years and they've built large customer bases and have strong brands, yeah. Uh, but maybe they need some help with, you know, more modern technology and better products and better client experiences. You know, that's a pretty good opportunity to work together. Okay, cool. So we turn to Me? Yep. Do my do my minutes roll over if I don't use them? <laughs> <laughs> that would be That answer. would be awesome. <laughs> well, that's yeah. your um, no. All right. Uh, so I think uh, thanks for open, for talking about the spaces. I think you're right. There's a lot of misconceptions about what we do. Uh, I think we agree on the whole idea of partnering with large financial institutions. You saw CHIPS numbers, right? It's something like um, you know, the entire industry of standalone venture funded verbal advisors of which we were part of uh, until very recently added together are single digit billions. Um, single firms are multi-digit trillions <laughs> off by an order of magnitude. Uh, and so, actually several orders of magnitude. And so I think the to, to answer your other question, the unique approach that we, Future Advisor, as part of BlackRock, try to bring to the table is to try to marry the speed of innovation at a startup uh, that has a near billion dollar D2C business um, on which we are iterating very fast, on which we're releasing to production twice a day and running a bunch of tests all simultaneously, um, with the stability, security, and long-term investment and the, and the uh, IP collection of the largest asset manager on Earth so that we can then take those two things together and then partner with our uh, distribution partners across the, across the US uh, to try to bring robo and bring the same uh, software mechanics to the existing either bank or advisory models that exist today. So you guys have heard my pitch, but I'll repeat it again. I don't think investors need to choose. I think you can get the benefit of 16,000 financial advisors and <clears throat> technology that helps it make uh, automate things and make it easier to do what you want to do. So it's the combination of both that's uh, the winning one. And so I think the strategy you guys are employing of empowering the traditional firms is a great one because that's where I think the, the value is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's go to the, the second question, which is what's the role, you know, if, if we're going to this mixed and kind of integrated world as it, you all seem to support, um, what's the role that human advisors play and what's the role that robo advisors play? Um, and how, how do you, what's the best marriage of both? I think actually splitting the world into two is probably a mistake. Like, I think ultimately what will happen is, hey, there's an audience of people who are not wealthy enough that the business model of having a traditional advisor spend a lot of time with them works. So today, you know, call them underserved, but basically there are probably 70, 80, 90% of the market who does not have access to good advice. And I think technology will give them access to good advice for the first time. I think there's going to be another kind of end of the spectrum where you're really wealthy, you have complex needs, and advisors will serve those needs better. And advisors will want to serve those needs because 
you're wealthy enough that they can make an, an honest living on that. And I think there'll be you know, a lot of gray in the middle where you, know, you may want some human advice, but you also probably don't have enough money that someone's going to spend a lot of time with you. And I think what's going to happen is over time, that line will shift and evolve. And the good advisors, as Chip was saying, is you know, they're probably not going to spend a lot of their time doing security selection and asset allocation and things like that. They're going to focus more on advice, planning, you know, like the more complex needs mm -hmm. that algorithms you know, and technology will be less well suited to serve. And I think you know, just not th instead of thinking about it as like two use cases, but a continuous spectrum, mm -hmm where the line where, you know, where advisors add value will shift over decades. That's kind of how we think about it. Okay. How do you think about it? That was awesome. <laughs> that was awesome. Uh, okay, so my, my thing, I think my answer is like really short here because think about all of our jobs, right? We all provide a service to our consumers. You know, how many of us utilize software in a deeply integrated way as part of our jobs to provide our services to our consumers? I would hazard to guess it was all of us. And I would say that Advisors traditionally in the field have been somewhat underarmed, right? When you sit down with an advisor and they like lay a, lay a, a uh, sheaf of statements and reports on the table next to you that can be measured in ounces, they're probably <laughs> underarmed. And so all that we are doing, I think all that we are all doing, yeah. right, is we're just arming them. And you know, all of us here are armed. It's not really reasonable to, to have advisors in the field be underarmed. Uh, and so it's not, like Mike was saying, it's not, uh, it's not a versus. I think the, the, the rumors of this like, large conflict are greatly exaggerated. It's just we're arming advisors. I think we've got a panel here that doesn't have a lot of disagreements. It's I know. Uh, <laughs> where's, where's the debate? Oh, we will. We, we will. Don't worry. We need controversy <laughs> here. Um, you know, what the technology, advice is more than just your investment selection and asset allocation. Advice is really about... How do you do your plan? How do you meet your goals? How do you live your life, estate planning? That is the whole picture of advice. What this technology brings us, which is exactly as Bo says, is allowing advisors to automate things that they had to do manually before through technology. So somebody's not sitting in the back office looking up cost basis and trying to figure out how to tax loss harvest off of uh, pieces of paper. And it frees up their time to spend more time on the things that really matter to them and their clients by automating the the stuff that doesn't as much. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk a little bit about the, the risks of robo advisors. Um, at the Milken conf uh, conference uh, this week, um, almost half of people in the audience or CEOs in the audience said there were flaws and algorithms that could prove to be an issue, and almost a third said they were concerned that robo advisors would ultimately provide you know faulty or bad advice. Um, how do you address how do you address this? I don't know that conference. I don't know who was there. I think ultimately, um, you know, part of uh, part of building a robust system is actually having the right controls in place to make sure that the software actually works. There is software that runs all kinds of mission critical stuff, mm -hmm. and the notion that you know rebalancing a portfolio is more complex than what a lot of software does in our lives, I think, is probably a little bit malformed. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, my gut is that. You know, that person probably didn't come from a software background, you mm -hmm. know, to, to make a statement like that. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have to be careful. Like, of course, we have to be careful in, you know, how the algorithms are built and how the software works. But, you know, I just think there's, there's so much more complex things that software does in our lives today where we, I mean, we get on a plane. You think the pilot's flying it, but, like, the pilot's not flying the plane. Yeah. You know, like, there are automated systems that are flying that plane. And, in fact, if you look at the studies around plane crashes, it's almost always mm -hmm. human, you know, human the, the human intervention yeah. that causes the plane crash. Um, so you know, I think that's where, you know, even with self-driving cars, yeah. same thing. People are like, oh my gosh. You know. And it was not yet. five yeah. years ago that people thought that was ludicrous. Mm -hmm. And I think we live in a day and age today that actually probably that's going to happen pretty soon. And that's probably going to be a good thing in terms of driver safety. Mm -hmm. Can I say this, this self-driving car thing? So I was having this conversation with my friends, and we were like, you know, you know those conversations you have, you think you're gonna have with your kids in the future? We're gonna have this exact conversation. We're gonna have, you know, you're gonna be talking to your, maybe your grandparents, grandkids, maybe how long the regulations take. But you'll say, you know, back in my day, people drove themselves to work. <laughs> and they'll be like, no, wait, and nobody died? And we're like, no, tens of thousands of people died all the time. <laughs> and they're like, what, but, 
what, what, <laughs> right? And I think that, that same, like, we're CS majors, and so we get the fact that software is trustable, is trustworthy to do all kinds of things. Now, humans with interesting incentives sometimes create software that doesn't do the right things, right? Like, if you don't have a man in the loop, and you're trying to race for, uh, you know, literally milliseconds, folks know the story that they, like, raise a micro, a microwave tower between like New York and uh, uh, and Chicago that cut down the latency on a particular uh, F, you know trade by like 200 milliseconds. People paid millions of dollars for it, right? That's not any of these businesses. I don't, I don't, none of us are gunning for milliseconds here, but we are. We have an incredible amount of controls in place, uh, and I think you know, especially for us uh, now as part of a larger company that is known for risk analysis and risk management from the get-go, we now have a lot more controls in place, uh, and so you know, it's. I think lumping all of computing together as an unsafe thing, I think, is malformed. And I think people will see over the long term that this is one of the easier things that computers does. I totally agree with you. Um, so working for a company that's regulated by FINRA, the SEC, the OCC, the Fed, mm -hmm. um, I'm, I might have run out of regulators. But um, this is actually an important issue. So there's the Milton Conference, but there's also the FINRA suitability guidance that they issued earlier. And I think it's an, what's important is the intersection between the questionnaire, so mm -hmm. how you assess risk, and then how you assign the portfolio. And it's that logic in between where we need to be really careful. It, it's not about the computer, I agree with Bo. It's about what are the rules that you put into the computer mm -hmm. and the robustness of, of that. And I think it's an area that is uh, under a lot of scrutiny, and we have to make sure that we get that as robust as possible, and where, uh, in, whereas applicable, particularly in our case, get the advisor to make sure that they take a second look and we don't have you know, the 90-year-old woman sitting in a hyper-aggressive portfolio and that the matching, the matching actually works. But it's a big area of making sure that all of our I's and T's are all crossed because it's a, it's a big topic of regulatory scrutiny. Mm -hmm. um, so, I want to ask all of you how you decide between, I mean, like, I think you guys are probably going to agree on this, but like, mm -hmm. building, buying, or partnering, mm -hmm. and what's the best approach? Well, we'd like to buy Morgan Stanley. Sorry. <laughs> 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 that's what you meant? <laughs> um, uh, no, I think, um, Bo and I probably, I'll let you speak for yourself, but sure. I think we probably both firmly believe that with the vast um, number of financial services firms out there, and the likelihood that very few of them are kind of wired at the core culturally as a technology company. Yeah. You know, technology is playing such an important role in the evolution of this industry. And I think that's why Clara is able to put such a great room of people together. And I think ultimately what that means is that most firms probably will partner. I think there'll be a few firms that build. And there'll be a few firms that buy. Um, but I think partnering is probably going to be, you know, the, what, what the solution that serves most of the marketplace. Yeah. So I think it's, there's, this is actually a question we think about all the time, right? Um, there's three things, right? The first is speed to market. How fast do you need it? Uh, yeah. Generally, you know, you yeah. were, you were need deep on this all the time. So if you, need it real, if you need it relatively quickly, and here relative is relative, right? If you need it within the next n number of months, you probably need to either buy or partner. Uh, second is what is your appetite for long-term investment? Like we you know, I'll say we, BlackRock, we are sinking untold millions into this because we know that this is a, I think Morgan Stanley is too, right? Uh, we're, this, is an, this is the second inning of a long game. And it's not going to end with, you know, ETF selection for millennials. It's going to pervade all the other parts of our digital lives. And so do you have, you know, lots of millions of dollars to spare over the next 10, 15, 20 years? Are you able to, like us, uh, win head-to-head -head against Amazon, against Apple, against other startups for engineering talent in the valley? Uh, do you have great computer science majors who can lead organizations because devs don't like working for non-devs? That's the thing. Um, and third is core competency, right? Uh, is your core competency um, serving your advisor force? Is it investment acumen? Well, then you should probably do one of the other things. But if your core competency is consumer internet software, then by all means, right? So think, or you can build that core competency. I think it's those three things, speed to market, appetite for long-term investment, your ability to compete in the talent marketplace, and then your, what, what your core competency is. And, and if you do it yourself, I hope that it will become, or it already is, uh, core consumer internet. So I, I, 
as I said earlier, I think digital is far more than just robo. So as we look at everything that we're doing on a digital perspective, the answer will vary depending on which particular function we're talking about based on factors, as Bo said, of, OK, where are there other part, great partners out there that have already built this and it's not a core competency, so why should we, why should we try? Where are there areas where we already have software that we can build off of that can become a broader foundation? Or, you know, where is there something easy we could plug in and buy? It really, there's no one answer. It completely depends on the situation in that particular speed, in that particular part of the digital value chain. Mm -hmm. One thing I've kind of noticed that's kind of interesting is I think, and so oh, I'm I stealing your time. Look at that. I, can't, I can't even get close to the 30 no, seconds. You're good. I just, Michael hit it on the dot. I talk, I talk too fast. Michael yeah. hit on the dot. Watch this. Yeah, yeah, take yeah, my yeah, time. No, yeah. um, <laughs> it's interesting. And, and you know, when we spend time with partners, there's a tech org, there's a business org. And you watch these dynamics, and it's quite interesting because I think the business org has been told sometimes to use the tech org to serve their tech needs. And the problem is tech org resources get allocated kind of quarter by quarter, project by project. You get funded for a budget to do something. The team comes on. They build it. You're lucky if it's good and it's on time. Let's say it is. But then after it ships, the team's kind of moved on to something yeah, totally. else. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And the business owners left trying to build a good business. You even ran out the, of my we'll time. The buzzer yeah, finish. Time. <laughs> um, I'll loan so, you some of the next question to keep so going. So speaking <laughs> a little bit on uh, like the, this conflict, um, what, what does the rise of robo-advisors mean for asset management companies and insurers? And how should they change their behavior or strategy accordingly? Oh, this, this could brew some, some debate. I All think. right. <laughs> I, well, let's let Bo first, since he, he <laughs> now is part of a, a asset management, asset management firm. firm. Uh, all right, I think, I think what you saw earlier, um, it was me who asked the question in the back when, when uh, Amit from PayPal Braintree was here. And he's saying, look, we own the consumer experience. We have all this data. We're extending credit. We might be, you know, nothing prevents him long term from writing insurance. Nothing prevents him from creating 40 act funds and ETFs. Um, and I asked him from way in the back, is, is Amit still here? Um, but I said, anyway, I asked him from way in the back, what are, what are we going to do, <laughs> right? What are you, what are you going to say, I'm going to depend on other people to do X in that value chain? Um, and, you know, he talked for a while, but it wasn't really clear what it is that we're going to do if you don't own the consumer interaction. And so I think, uh, I think people are now coming to the, probably the realization over time that you need to get as close to your consumer as possible. And by, it is by understanding your consumer and the segmentation within the consumers and their particular needs that you're actually going to be able to innovate on product along the entire stack. So that's my view, at least. So like for asset managers, I think it depends on your strategy. If the strategy is to go to direct to consumer, this is a great and easy way to do it and that wasn't available before. Um, so I think there's an opportunity there. And I think for a lot of other firms that are in adjacencies, right, who are doing maybe consumer lending or insurance or other things, if you want to get into the investment management part of your consumer, and I say investment management, not wealth management, because I think wealth management's for more. Mm. But if you just want to get into the investment management part of your, of your customer's wallet, this is an easy technology to help you do that and add on a product and service. So I think it depends on, on the strategy you're employing. I'm going to take your, sorry, I'm going to take your 20 seconds, <laughs> yeah, to say, 20 seconds. and say, uh, but, but even for firms like ours who are not direct to consumer businesses, I think it behooves us to, uh, to think like and to innovate like a direct to consumer business. Yes, because if that. you abdicate the last mile, then you're not actually never going to figure out to build. Yeah. Agree. Let's go back to you. So I was going to say, you know, just to brew some controversy, um, I have a lot of respect for Bo, I have a lot of respect for BlackRock. But I do think that there are trends in the industry that move towards open architecture and mm -hmm. independence. Um, and so it was great to see as part of the announcement mm -hmm. that BlackRock you know, made a commitment to kind of keep it open architecture. Mm -hmm. And I hope that happens. Mm -hmm. Because I think you know, with DOL rule, with the, with the just draw, broader arc of what's happening in advice, not just in the US, but globally, I think regulators are finding that removing conflicts of interest is like the right side of history. Okay. And, um, and so I think you know, putting advice in product manufacturing in the same umbrella gets a little bit tricky. Okay. 
I think you'll see all of us do open architecture, not just in the product side, but also in the model side for some of our partnerships. Is, you know, it's, they have a GIC, a global investment committee, and they're the ones who are, who are um, leading the way on selecting models. So I think it's at every layer it'll be open architecture. Okay. So the last question before we open to audience um, participation, who um, in, in this new age of robo-advisors, who are the winners and losers? And you definitely have to talk about the losers. Who <laughs> you think the losers might be? We'll probably say the same thing. I mean, winners, mm -hmm. consumers yep. for sure. Yeah. Yep. That's yep. great. Uh, especially the ones who are underserved. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, losers, I think poor advisors. None of us believe that all advisors are poor. There are a lot of great advisors out there. But mm -hmm. I think the ones who are not as good at what they do, or at least they held their value props around the things that maybe machines do better. Mm -hmm. right. um, I think those you know, will, will, will be in trouble. Um, there's an interesting debate, you know, and Chip brought it up around active versus passive. And I think he was spot on where it's like, it's not like passive is better than active. I think it's a difference about fee efficiency. Mm -hmm. And so I think what you're gonna see in active is a movement towards more fee efficient active, which will hopefully you know, create you know, a little bit of um, competition against you know, what seems like to be a, a passive winning battle. Mm -hmm. You should go. Yeah, well, so that way you could take my time at the end. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I couldn't agree with Mike more. I think the winner is the consumer, and those that can't make the transition up to be full service wealth managers offer more will get left behind. So I, I totally agree. And, and there you get 45 extra I'm seconds. I'm actually going to roll over all my minutes to, uh, at this point for the audience participation okay. part because at this point, right. I, we'll, I, mean, I think we're all in yeah. agreement on okay. that one. Ask hard questions. Please do. Okay, Go for it. with each other. So I'd like, I'm gonna address this question to you two, Bo okay. and Mike. Okay. As a consumer, why would I sign up for SIGFIG or Future Advisor over anybody else? Okay. And then as an institution, potential partner for you, why would I work with you versus partnering with anyone else? Because you already answered the, the build versus buy. But like why would I partner with SIGFIG versus Future Advisor? Go Vice first. versa. All right. Uh, as a consumer, I think you should you should pick on the consumer experience, and if it's not us, then you should tell us why. And we we ask our consumers; we don't pick us why. Um, and I think you know there are not generally na natural network effects or the things like you know people pick Facebook because their friends are already on Facebook. But uh, but I think for us, it'll be consumer experience, and we'll we use the DTC business to continue to push the consumer experience forward um, because you generally actually can't be you know, tweaking pixels and flow and design changes on a partner's website, you know, 20 times a day because generally partners don't like that. Um, and so we'll take all those winnings, uh, you know, for every major release and bring them to our partners, but we'll use that as a testing ground. And then I think for the second question, it's very clear, uh, I think you should, you should partner with us um, if you care about the long-term survivability and longevity of BlackRock, which I think people presume they'll be here in the next, you know, two years from now, ten years from now, uh, and their continued investment in this space. You know, we're, when we were acquired, we were 40 people. We're now 80 people, probably going to double again in the next, you know, inside of the next year. Uh, this is an incredible amount of investments going to the space. And I think for the partners who partner with us, you know, you will accrue all of the benefits of all the downstream investments that we're making. And who are you partnering with right now? Can you share any examples? Yeah, I think we've uh, announced that we've um, signed partnerships with LPL, um, folks like RBC, uh, and uh, the Compass division of BBVA in, in the US. I think, um, is there, uh, so the first part of your question in terms of consumers, um, I think when you look at the robo category, you know, sometimes we get put in that category, sometimes we don't. Let's just say for a second that we're in it. Um, Across the players, I think we end up getting recognized for having really the highest quality user experience and design and usability and this whole idea of being able to kind of sign up and do, have it be real easy, all that stuff. That's ultimately where we've ended up investing a lot of our R&D. Um, obviously, I think what's, one of the things that's going to happen is over the next few years, I think the capability set of that platform is start, going to start to diverge. Mm -hmm. So different players will start focusing on different segments of the market. And part of where we have always tried to focus is instead of just serving millennials who are young, mm -hmm. how do you serve the needs of a much broader range of investment categories? So like we were the first um, platform that you, know, you could actually bring in outside assets, get them analyzed. We would give you an investment checkup to help you figure out if you had opportunities to improve your current portfolio. And then if you had us manage your current portfolio, we would actually 
be scientific about like what do you keep, what do you sell, you know, like all that stuff. Um, I think on the enterprise side, it's an interesting thing because you know when when you when you look at the enterprise buyers out there, um, they do look for different things. Some of them are extremely risk averse, and so having the backing of BlackRock is going to be you know a great thing. I know in the in the partners who have chosen us, part of what they really see is a dedicated team of subject matter experts actually beyond just technology. So we built up you know, capabilities. We run a, a call center down in Phoenix where we will do outsourced operations. We've got a design and usability lab to think about access to. We've got a marketing team that does CRM integration. You know, so there's a lot of different kind of categories of what we can do for them. And I think that's going to be useful if you want more of kind of an end-to-end -end solution as opposed to like an algorithm that can manage you know, the, the actual assets. But you know, different firms will have different needs. So you know, we try to be this provider for someone who wants kind of that end-to-end -end solution. And can you talk about any of your partners? I wish I could tell you. Uh, we have quite a few that are confidential. Um, but uh, maybe in the coming weeks, you'll see some of that coming out. OK, I think we have time for one more short question. You were talking about some of the losers. And I'm wondering if this is perhaps kind of a wag the dog. And I'm, the question is, do you think that as we take the human element out of decision making for investments, that some of the like funds or other um, investments that are not as fee efficient are going to have to change? Or will they be some of the losers? Okay. Yeah, so uh, I think um, the expensive funds who don't perform a particular niche yeah. role are going to lose and, and badly so. And in a time, in a less transparent market where you could get away with that at some scale, I mean, look, $30 trillion, right, $60 trillion over the course of the, um, uh, in the next 20 years, according to the chip, uh, there was enough to go around for that. I think with the transparency that digital brings across the board, uh, you're absolutely right. Well, thank you guys so much, and thank you, Clara.